Hello, everybody. Please give me a big thumbs up in the chat if you can hear me loud and clear. Let me know that you can hear me. Hello, hello, hello. I see Virginia Beach in the house, Illinois, Florida, Texas. I always love seeing. I always love doing this and checking the, the chats. Someone said good afternoon from Connecticut. I had Connecticut on my mind this morning. I actually just ate. It just ate a, and let me just not say an entire, I, I had like a couple slices of, from a Sally's pizza from Connecticut. If you don't know about that, that is absolutely fantastic. So, a bunch of you are here. Fantastic, wonderful, and I see that you can hear my audio. So, welcome everybody. Welcome to another amazing, fantastic, wonderful webinar. Okay, um, we are going to be going over appraisals today. So if you're here live with me or on recording, please remember to hit that like button. It really does help us out over here at the Prep Agent team. Myself, Candice, Maria, Joe, we all appreciate it. And good luck to everyone who's taking the test uh, fairly, uh, fairly soon. Um, I see a bunch of you are typing that in as well in the chat. So without further ado, why don't we jump right into it? I don't, wanna, I don't even have much housekeeping because... I think it's kind of like a dull week this week. <laughs> so let's go ahead. Let's take a look at the first question. So the first question says, a home with its kitchen next to the master bedroom would be considered functionally obsolete, physically obsolete, diminished, or economically obsolete. So what say you? So someone said, past state for Illinois. I'm working on my national. <laughs> Excuse me. Super common. Yeah, super, super common to sh be on the struggle bus for the national um, and to pass the uh, state the state exam. National is hard. That's why, that's why all our webinars here are usually going to be geared towards that national portion. That's the portion that people usually struggle with. So when we're talking about a home that has a kitchen right next to the master bedroom, we're going to be talking about functionally obsolete so what happens here is this functional obsolescence i want to make sure that you understand this functional obsolescence is a dated feature means hey there is something about this home that is outdated so so listen to what i'm going to tell you okay so let me ask you this what is fun what is physical deterioration what is physical deterioration and Jenna said there is a national crash course on uh, February 18th. Yeah, uh, who's is that Maria, I think, teaching it? I think Maria's teaching that one. I don't know. But check it out. Definitely check it out. That's why, listen, that's why we offer these things so that we can help you out as mu much as possible. Wear and tear. So someone said physical deterioration is wear and tear. Yeah, Maria's fantastic. She knows her stuff. Um. So physical deterioration is wear and tear. So here's the thing. Let me, and I'm going to kind of give you an example of something that is not, okay? And I always like to give examples when it comes to this because I think people sometimes, uh, sometimes mess this up. They confuse functional obsolescence and physical deterioration. So let me just see by, by uh, you know, everyone in the chat. Um, it, it, give me a big smile if you confuse physical deterioration and functional obsolescence. Give me a big smile in the chat. Um, can you rewatch a crash course? Is there available for 14 days? I think 14 or 15 days, give or take, uh, afterwards. They're meant to be live products that you watch live. And we give you the recording so that if you miss something because you're in a virtual environment, okay, you, you have the capability of re-watching stuff. So a couple of people are typing in the chat. Yeah, that, that definitely does confuse me. And here's the thing. Something could be functionally obsolete but not physically deteriorating. Okay? Um, and something could be physically deteriorating and not functionally obsolete. The two do not go hand in hand. So watch this. Let me give you a dated feature. Right? Let's say that I were to put in... Let's say that I lived in an area where I just put in, you know, because it was cheaper... I put in radiator heat and that area, okay, that area is going to be um, basically most of the homes are forced hot air, right? Forced hot air. So we would say that the radiator heat is functionally obsolete, but I just put it in the home. Everything's brand new. So it's not physically deteriorating, okay? Then what happens is we could take 
Okay, we could take my home, for example. My home is a great example of this because I live walking distance, okay, walking distance to the uh, water. So a lot of my stuff, the salt water kind of deteriorates it really quickly. So my deck last year, my deck was beautiful. It was perfect floor, uh, footprint, everything. And it's a beautiful feature on added onto my home. But what happened was it physically deteriorates at a quicker pace than the rest of the home. So what happens is this. I had to replace the wooden planks on it. I actually replace them with composite now. Um, and what happened was that was because the home was physically deteriorating. So that's an example of something where we're experiencing physical deterioration, but we are not experiencing functional obsolescence. KG said, uh, I'm a little bit want to join and let everyone know I passed my broker exam first try. Boom. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, that is awesome. And said, thank you so much for the one-on-one -on -one tutoring last week. Helped a lot. Yeah. You know, shameless plug, um, you know, uh, sh shameless plug is this, uh, bottom line is if you do want to get extra help and you have some questions, concerns, burning desires in regards to, um, you know, just really getting some things hammered out, private tutoring is great. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's a situation where, um, bottom line is we could really help tighten some things up for you. And I listen, whether it be me, Candace, Maria, you know, tutoring with any one of us is really going to, is definitely going to help for a lot of you. So yeah, great. Congrats. Um, go out there and kill it. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's take a look at the next question. Okay. What is the basis of the market data approach to appraisal? The principle of conformity, the principle of supply and demand, the principle of substitution, and the principle of highest and best use. Yeah, and another thing, you know, KG uh, really, you know, came to every single webinar, pretty much. I mean, everyone that I've been on on the last couple of things. And I'm going to tell you this, whether you're watching on recording or live, I really do think these webinars are really like a secret sauce. Watch them on recording, watch the past ones. I mean, these are really so valuable. Oh, so some of you are tossed up between C is in cookie and D is in donut. Okay, let's take a look. Let's see. And I will tell you this. You ready? This one is going to be. So the basis of it, the basis is going to be the principle of substitution. So what is the principle of substitution? So let's talk about this for a second. The principle of substitution is going to be a principle of value that basically says that if two products are similar, the lower price one would sell first, okay? And what I will tell you is this, bottom line, okay, is the principle of substitution basically is the reason why. It is the basis for the market data approach. It is the basis for that okay it is the foundation the bedrock of why we could use the market data approach because when things are similar okay because when things are similar we could compare them that is the reason why we can use the market data approach so courtney said never adjust the subject property right because you don't know the price of the subject property how are you going to be adjusting something that you're trying to find okay so that is the situation there okay yeah, so someone said, you know, no one wants to pay more for something um, that is going to be similar or, you know, that they view in their mind is similar to something else. Yeah, so let me give you a perfect example. Like I, and I like giving this one because my old man, he is classic for this, okay? My old man, he loves listening to music, so we're always at a, at a bar at the Jersey Shore. And he would drink, he has two drinks, Heineken or Corona. That's it. That's all he drinks. He drinks either one of those. So we'll go up. So in his mind, those two are similar, despite what I think and despite what anyone else thinks. That's his preference. It's either one of those he's going to drink, and that's it. Now, he'll go up to a bar, and let's say Heineken was $5, and then Corona was $1. Well, what's he drinking? He's drinking Corona. Why? Because he's not going to spend $5 on the Heineken when he thinks, okay? Um, it, it, you know, when he thinks... That they're both the same, right? Think about that. If you think in your eyes they're both similar, you are not going to pay more for one than another. And that is, again, the bedrock and foundation of the market data approach. So let me ask this question, uh, talking about the market data approach. What type of properties are we typically appraising using 
the market data approach. What type of properties are we typically appraising? Tell me in the chat. Okay. Tell me in the chat. Residential ones or four family homes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let me throw this monkey wrench in. I just want to I just want to ask this question because I just want to kind of see what your thoughts are. Okay. What if it's rented out? What if it's an investment two family home? Let's just say re re rented out investment um uh, you know two family home am i still using the market data approach okay am i still using the market data approach what do you think what say you in the chat okay what say you in the chat if i had a two family that's rented out am i still using market data approach okay so for those of you who said no some people said income approach yeah i thought i was going to get that as a response okay Listen, 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 Linda. <laughs> I love that video from several years ago. Uh, what I want to say is this. Just because something is rent rented out, just because something is rented out doesn't mean that an appraiser is going to use the income approach. The best approach to find market data is the sales comparison approach. Okay. The market data or sales comparison approach is the best approach to find market value. Okay. It is the best. So if it is something that there is, if there are comparables, if there are comparables, okay. And it is not a unique property, like a commercial property. We're not going to default to the income approach just because it's rented out. Does that make sense? Let me know if you have any questions or concerns or burning desires in the chat as we're, as we're moving along. Anything in the chat? Because I want to just double check, see if there's any questions on that. Because I might spend any time on this. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of appraisals. Appraisals is actually my favorite section. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm a crazy cat like that. I like appraisals a lot. I actually have my appraisal license. So, well, let's take a look at the next one. A bearing wall in a home may be constructed at any angle to a doorway is usually left intact during remodeling. All the other options are correct. Usually includes stronger members than other interior walls. So a couple questions came in. Let me just take a look at them while you're answering this one. Um, so what if the property becomes an office building? Well, if it becomes an office building, if like that single family or multifamily home now becomes a unique commercial property and there are no other comparable homes that are selling, okay, it's going to be a situation where I would use the income approach. Okay, how about a new apartment building for investments? What approach? If it's brand new, listen listen to what I'm going to tell you. If it's brand new and there's no rental data, okay, then we're using the cost approach, okay? <laughs> well, Cynthia said, uh, hey, Stu, just jumping in. Yeehaw from Texas after brutal weather. Yeah, I've heard that you had some brutal weather. Um, yeehaw. I, I'm actually going to be going to Texas in a month or so. So let's take a look at this. So this one is, so what is a bearing wall? Great question. And guess what? If you're ever wondering what something is and it's highlighted in yellow, you could just click it. So I would have told you what the definition is, but I'm going to allow prep agent to tell you what the definition is. This says a wall which supports the weight of a, a part of a structure in addition to its own weight. So what happens is a bearing wall is basically a support structure. Okay. It's a support structure. And what happens is all those options are going to be correct. Okay. Um, yes, it's usually stronger than other interior walls because weight bearing walls have to be okay. It's basically, um, it is usually left intact during remodeling. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Okay. 100%. Uh, Nikki said after I passed my real estate exam, I'm planning on getting my appraisal license. It's fun. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, so any questions on this? In my opinion, more difficult to get licenses as an appraiser in most states. So, 
Option A confused me. So, yeah. So, let's talk about that, okay? Um, may be constructed at any angle to a doorway. So, depending on the structure, depending on the floor plan, the, um, the bearing wall could be constructed at any angle. It doesn't have to be a certain angle, like a 90-degree angle or things like that, okay? Someone said, can we use it in a sentence? Um, I mean... There's a sentence right there. A bearing wall is supporting any load in the vertical plane as well as its own weight. So here's the thing. What I will tell you is this. If you have a question or there's a confusion about what it is, feel free to let me know where the confusion is and where the pain is. I'm more than happy to clarify, but you got to give me the pain point, okay? Uh, yeah, please, 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 100%. Uh, give me a like uh, if you're watching recording live. Yeah, that really does help me out. Uh, okay. <laughs> Someone said, it, uh, Captain Ron said, look at this room. It has a funny angle bearing wall. Uh, there's another use for it in a sentence. Yeah. I mean, jokes aside, though, like I said, if you do have a question about something, um, you know, like I said, feel free to give me, see what happens is this. I think a lot of times, you know, especially when you're coming into the chats, you're, you're working with any of the instructors live. Um, give specificity as to what your question is, because also too, when you give specificity as to what your question is, it might also help you understand what it is you're actually confused with. Like, because here's the thing. So imagine this picture, this in your head, you say, Hey, I don't understand what bearing wall is. Okay. So what is it that you don't understand about that? And try to actually ask yourself that as you're studying, so what is it about a bearing wall that you don't understand, you know? Um, and if it's like, hey, I don't understand exactly what it is, you know, and then you could read it, read through the different explanations, maybe go into a, an audio lesson, search for it on the YouTube channel, right? And see how we have explained it in the past and see if one of those hits home for you, if one of those makes sense for you. But again, try to identify where your pain point actually is, okay? Um, because that's going to be a situation where that might help you. Uh, no, there is no stupid question. Absolutely not. Uh, so I always say, I always encourage you to ask the questions. But like I said, the better the answer is going to be d is dependent on the specificity of the question, okay? There's a big difference in the results I'm going to get if I go into my doctor and I say, I am in pain, as opposed to, my left shoulder hurts. We're going to really probably find a better way to find a solution in the second response than in the first one, right? He might have to ask a lot more questions to get to where I actually, you know, need help or how he can best help me, okay? So that is going to be something that will help you, I promise you. So let's look at this one. The income capitalization approach to value would be most important in the most important in the appraisal of an condominium, vacant residential lot, single family residence, or office building. What say you in the chat? What say you? Okay. Yeah, I warmly welcome questions because I mean, look. Bottom line is, when you stop asking questions, that's when I don't have a job anymore. <laughs> that's when prep agent is like, "Why do we need you?" Chat GPT is gonna take over my job. That's what's gonna happen just going to be talking to a chat GPT in here. So a lot of you are saying office building. D is an office building would 100% be correct. It's basically a situation where, okay, um, what happens is this. Any type of commercial property, okay, such as an office building, would definitely be the income approach. So let me explain why. And, and I think that this is important. This is one of the reasons I like to go into this. So why do we use the office, the, the commercial properties as an example of what they would be using the income approach for? So here's what happens. When you have a building or a commercial property, typically they're super unique, right? So think about it. Close your eyes. Go down like your major highway where all your shopping plazas are. Your Target, your your Walmart, you know, like for us around by where I am, we would refer to that as Route 35, okay? You like Route 35 has all the, the Wegmans, the Walgreens, the, I don't know, you West Coasters aren't going to know this. Actually, many people outside of New Jersey, Pennsylvania might not know this, but a Wawa, where your Wawa is, 
Give me a big smile in the chat if you know what a Wawa is and how amazing and magical that is. And then I might I might tell you a funny story about what that is for the, everyone who doesn't know. So yeah, what happens is you're picturing all those in your head, right? Because that's what I asked you to do. And what happens is they're all unique. Think about it. They're all super duper 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 unique, okay? Um, 100% super unique. And what happens is this, even if there was activity, okay, even if there was activity, what happens is the properties are not going to be similar enough to actually use, okay, to actually use the, um, what was I going to say? To actually use the sales comparison approach. That's why we don't use it, okay? Uh, Wawa, Pennsylvania. Some people love Wawa. So someone said it's like a 7-Eleven. It's a 7-Eleven on steroids. On steroids. Like, it's crazy. I can't even describe it. But let's look at this one. When appraising a commercial prop, when appraising a commercial property, the appraiser is most concerned with the sales price of comparable properties, total debt service on the property, Accrued depreciation or the income generated by the property. A ton of people. Now I got all my Wawa fans in the chat. Basically, Wawa is like in and out Burger of the East Coast. It's like you don't have it on the West Coast, but it's awesome. It's amazing. So what? Are, what say you? So we're, we're we're doing it at commercial property, and we're just we're digging more into this um, income approach. Okay. And basically what happens is this, okay? It is the income generated by the property. Yeah, because we're doing the income approach, okay? Um, we were just, we're, we're going to be doing the income approach. So the appraiser is most concerned with how much money are you bringing in, okay? As far as the income generated by the property. And we're talking rental income. Someone said Bucky's. I've been to a Bucky's. Bucky's is crazy. That is a crazy place. <laughs> um, oh, now you're gonna make me. Now you're gonna make me want to travel and everything. So yeah. So this one, getting back to the question, okay, is the income generated by the property. So let me ask this: Are there any questions, concerns, burning desires on this? And you know, we've spoken a lot about the income approach and the different approaches to uh, value. So any questions on this one? Okay. I do have to try the Whataburger, though. I'm going to be going to Texas in March. So, business trip. Yay. Let's look at this one. Which of the following would be classified as external depreciation? A leaking roof that needs to be completely replaced? Convenient access to schools and recreational facilities? Poorly maintained properties in the neighborhood? Or poorly designed floor plan that could be modified. So we're talking external depreciation. Nathan said hot turkey sub for Thanksgiving time from Wawa. Yeah, that's killer. Killer. This is totally my, as you can see. So if you haven't noticed by the time you've listened to all of my webinars, I have horrific ADHD. So some of you who have ADHD might see, you know, my little pigeon brain going off and how I conduct my webinars and you might be like, oh, that seems like my brain. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, if you are like me, if you are like me, take breaks, take breaks, 100% take breaks. Okay. Take breaks. Okay. So, um, it makes it fun and engaging. I never, you'll never have a boring webinar for me. That's for sure. But it does make it so that it is extremely difficult for me to, um, you know, uh, to, to really focus on something for a long period of time. Um, so someone said, do you have study suggestions for, um, ADHD? Okay. Um, yeah, just basically take breaks and just let your kind of let your pigeon brain kind of like just and I say pigeon brain not to say that you have a small brain, but that's how I always refer to like my ADHD as my little pigeon brain. It's just like there's just something happening in a corner somewhere and I have to go tend to it or, you know, I just basically get to a point where you could easily pull me off topics. I try to get back to the topic. I try to make sure I get back to the question, all that kind of stuff. And I try to keep everything relevant to what everyone's listening to me for. So... Take breaks, kind of what your ADHD kind of dictated. If it's just, if you're not 
feeling it that moment that day and this goes for anyone okay um just let your let let your mind kind of just do what it needs to do if it tells you hey we could go for 15 20 minutes longer let it go if it says hey look we got to cut it short today that's fine okay that's definitely it so external depreciation also known as economic obsolescence okay we haven't talked about this okay is basically going to be anything outside of the property lines. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. There's a difference, okay? There's a difference between outside of the property, like the siding, the roof, all those things, and then, okay, uh, and then there's things that are going to be external obsolescence or external depreciation, like economic obsolescence, which is outside of the property lines, Okay, something down the block, something down the street, something on the corner. Okay, and it's something depreciating the property. So the fact that I have a Wawa on the corner of my street, not depreciating it. See how I did that? Brought everything full circle. Okay, uh, <laughs> the fact that I'm walking distance to the water, all things that are not depreciating my property. So that although they are classified as external to my property lines, we wouldn't consider them obsolescence, right? We wouldn't co- consider them obsolescence, okay? So that's the situation there, okay? So that is going to be it. Poorly maintained properties in the neighborhood definitely would bring it down, okay? Let's look at the next question. What is an example of functional obsolescence? We've talked about this one too. Um, so chipping paint and other deferred maintenance, five bedroom with one bath, uh, a decrease in the area's population or unattractive curb appeal. What say you in the chat? Um, I need good places to go to in Texas. So actually, you know what? I could actually say it because I think that um, some some people have uh, or might have already heard. If you're if you're going when you, if you pass your exam by March, and you happen to join Next Home Brokerage, I'm going to be speaking at their national conference in March. 40 minutes me on microphone on un, unfiltered talking about how to get started in the business so a lot of you're saying b is in bob the builder love it yes an example of functional obsolescence five bedroom one bathroom home where in texas i'll be speaking in houston houston um so and thank you for uh, uncle g said congratulations yeah i i, I used to speak a lot Okay, um, I used to speak a lot for uh, at different conferences and everything. So, um, someone asked a great question: How long of a break should you take? How long, however long you need, uh, however long you need. Okay, um, so if you need twenty minutes, if you need thirty minutes, if you need a day, take it. Like let your mind kind of dictate. Because again, for me, how I've learned to study, how I've learned to manage things, is I found that I can't fight that. If my brain isn't going to pay attention, then I'm not there. I, I, I could try to force stuff into my brain. It's not working. So, yeah, an example of functional obsolescence is going to be a dated feature. Um, a dated feature such as a five-bedroom, one-bath home. Okay. Um, someone said, any food types in mind? I'm in Houston. Oh, yes. Uh, so if you're in Houston, uh, land animals. I love land animals. If it's a creature of the sea, no. But land animals? Yes. Almost anything. Okay. Um, someone said, yeah, that was me yesterday. I was so burnt out. I had I had to take a break. Yeah, that, that's important. And I think that's really, listen, I, I mean, I know that I talk about some study tips, some study habits, and I, I, I like to give you that information a lot because I think it's important. I, listen, listen I, I treat you as if you were family. Okay. I treat you as if you're family. As if I'm talking to someone who is near and dear to my heart because I really think that someone needs to say it for you. Um, Say it to you is that you you do need to take those breaks. You do need to listen to what your brain is saying. If your brain is saying nay, nay, no, not happening, okay, that's going to be it. So Nathan said, I feel like I stay more engaged in webinars than crash courses. Yeah, and the crash courses might not be for you then. And here's the thing. That's why I don't do – so if you notice, I don't – do a ton myself because that is basically mental torture for me almost. Um, I, I do it because it's part of my job and I try to help everyone, but I, I dread webinars sometimes and I try to make them as engaging as possible, 
But those long stretches are tough as an instructor. Well, for me, personally, someone who suffers from ADHD, where I'm just basically like, if there's a bright light, um, you know, uh, I'm basically distracted. You know, it's it's that's very hard, very hard. Gatsby Steakhouse, I'm going to go to it. Done. So, um, that being said, uh, that being said, I want to just ask everyone this, because I know we spoke a lot about, um, I, we spoke a lot about a lot of different things. We spoke a lot about um, the uh, appraisals. Is, are there any questions that I haven't touched on today? I, I'd be more than happy to take any kind of questions in the chat before uh, we wrap up for today. Okay. So, Someone said I go closer to coastlines and meditate. Yeah, that's why I live by water. I have to always live by water because I'm, I'm big at, like, just, I like hearing the waves crash. I'm just, that's, like, totally me. Okay. Someone said vacant land. Vacant land is always appraised using the, using, excuse me, the sales comparison approach. Always appraised using the sales comparison approach because, because unimproved land cannot generate income and we can't rebuild uh, we can't rebuild land. So here's what I'm going to tell you also too. Yeah, if someone's uh, Janet said that loves to do webinars. Yeah. And I appreciate that so much really from the bottom of my heart. Um, remember follow me on real estate exam pro on uh, Instagram and I'd be more than happy to, um, to, uh, you know, help you out. And also when you get your career started, I'm going to be doing a lot of coaching in the coming months. So, uh, one of the reasons why I'm speaking at the national conference over in Houston, um, someone said, can you give me a simple explanation for each approach? Bam. Let's do a 30 second rundown. Sales comparison approach is going to be when you compare sold comparables to the subject property that's usually used for one to four family units. Cost approach, brand spanking new properties. Like we have no data on it whatsoever. No comparables, no rental income and special purpose buildings such as churches, schools, libraries, things that just you don't have comparables for, okay? Um, you don't have comparables for, and there's no rental income, right? Then the income approach is going to be your income generating properties. And when we say income, we mean rental income, okay? So rental income generating properties that are going to be uh, unique, you know, so like commercial properties, okay, things like that. So that being said, I want to just say thank you to everybody who uh, who's here listening and uh, look have a great one and I will see everyone real soon have a great one everybody <laughs>